Hello, welcome to the TFO Football Podcast. Today we are going to be talking to Adam Bushby and Rob McDonald about their new book, From the Jaws of Victory, which is uh, a history of football's nitty men. It's really the most, most wonderful collection of football writings, full of emotive pieces about teams that very, very nearly got to where they wanted to go from lots of different points in history, lots of different characters, lots of different writing styles. There's a whole chapter by our very own Brooks Peck from The Athletic about Ghana's 2010 World Cup and uh, the heartbreaking exit to uh, to Uruguay at the hands of Luis Suarez. It's uh, just We just have a chat about how we remember these teams, really, and the kind of the emotions they inspire in us. It's, um, yeah, it was great fun. So I hope you enjoy it too. Let's get to it. Okay, so Adam and Rob, tell us why and how and how long What's, what's the process for putting the book together been like for you? It's Well, it began life actually quite a number of years ago as part of our blog. So we were, um, without wanting to give away our age too much, um, part of the sort of blogging scene um, in sort of 2010 onwards um, and had a sort of few series run on our blog where we invited different people to write about different subjects. And one of those subjects was a a series called What If, uh, where we sort of reimagined some um, quite famous uh, nearly teams and scenarios. Um, And yeah, that sort of one of those series evolved into the book that we put out in 2013, which was Falling for Football, but another one um, we revisited in the pub (laughs) uh, just before lockdown. Um, which was the What If series. And um, Adam and I, without knowing that lockdown was coming, uh, decided that it would be a good uh, sort of project for us to revisit that and try and, um, yeah, create some create some new stories, revisit some old ones, um, get some people involved that, that we knew and that we wanted to, to write uh, some pieces uh, that we could hopefully put together in a book. We didn't sort of start out thinking it would definitely be one. Um, or certainly that it would definitely be the book that it is. Um, but yeah, we we sort of found everyone to be incredibly receptive to the idea, incredibly helpful. Um, we very speculatively really sent most of our emails out um, as lockdown sort of started and we, we kind of worked through it in those few months. And the last, yeah, two to three months has just been trying to tie the loose ends um getting the yeah getting the artwork and stuff put together and and sort of scrambling to make sure that everything was as good as it could be really so yeah that's that's where we are we're really pleased with the finished product obviously um but it's definitely been a lot of work for doing it by ourselves for the first time and adam why did we why did, why did you choose this topic because i i it's not misery it's just that one of the things you notice online is that kind of one of the trends seems to be that a lot of people write what they think other people will want to hear or, or uh-huh. read. Um, and there's something quite nostalgic about going back to sort of, not hard luck stories, but, you know, um, teams that just fail to reach what, they're, what, what, what they set out to achieve. What was it about this topic that you wanted to do? Why was that kind of, I suppose the, the, the question is, why, why did so many people want to be involved in it specifically? I think that there seems to be a severe lack of patience at the moment. And I, I think it's been festering for a few years. And patience as in if you don't win something or if you don't get us into the European leagues, if it's the Premier League or whatever it might be, I think nobody seems to be given any time anymore. And me and Rob also, have, I think it's people of our age. And again, I'll back Rob up and say I don't want to speculate about our age. But I think there's something about <laughs> guys in there uh, Let's say guys in their 30s. Let's just say guys yeah. who aren't 20 anymore. Every, let's just <laughs> call it that, all right? Yeah. <laughs> guys that in their 20s, I think, have a real fondness for stuff like USA 94, for Euro yeah. 96, and, but genuine, genuine affection for those kind of um, those tournaments. And apart from that, you've got teams like Newcastle uh, from 95, 96, who were brilliant for the neutral of which we have Daniel Gray, 
brilliant Daniel Gray has done a chapter on that. Wonderful writer. Um, it, wonderful, it's wonderful a writer. really, really fantastic chapter, is that? And um, I don't know. I think it's. I think the nostalgia comes from there's something almost nicer and sweeter about nearly getting there. And that's what me and Rob were talking about in the pub, um, which happens to be the pub that we also came up with our first book six six years ago. I think it is, Rob. Is that right? Yeah. So there's a nice little arc there, and it's the Guy Fawkes pub, would you believe, in York, <laughs> where we should be drinking now. Obviously, we can't because of lockdown. Um which makes our intro out of date immediately before it's even gone, to, <laughs> gone out to the public, which is nice. But you can read all about that when you get your hands on the book. So there seems to be that let's hark back to a better time, and, and the better time comes because you're younger. It's not because the times were better, it's because you were younger. I genuinely think it was a better time. Correct me if you guys think that I'm wrong. I just think there was something very innocent. It, we were just on the cusp. The Premier League was just about... It certainly wasn't the behemoth that it is today. It was just about, it was there, it was this big brash thing. It was new. USA 94 was this big brash thing. Looking back at those teams made us realise that hard luck stories are certainly nothing new. Our first chapter is Bolton in the um, Stanley Matthews final that uh, Scott Murray's done for us. So obviously that goes back to the 50s. And it carries on to this day, but I think that obviously you're going to get a football fan that looks back on, say, Liverpool come in second with Suarez, Sterling and Sturridge up front, they might look back at that in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the same way that we look back at these teams in the 90s. That's that's what I think will happen. I think also it's me and Adar, uh, Macclesfield Town and York City fans respectively and never is there sort of a great two illustrations of the fact that you tend to have to get used to defeat a lot more than victory in football. Um, it's a much more common occurrence it's a much more common thing to not win trophies than it is to win trophies um and there are a huge number of stories obviously teams that lose in the finals or semi-finals or everyone gets knocked out of competitions at some point and all those teams tend to have or certainly some of those teams tend to have great stories and they're the ones that we tried to sort of dig out for this book really so there's a, yeah there is a nostalgic sort of tint to it which is why a lot of the chapters kind of cover the 90s and the 2000s really but even the more historical ones um you know there's there's a common theme underlying all that which is it's a much more common emotion to suffer defeat in football than it is victory and in terms of silverware anyway and there, there are quite a few underdog stories and, and so I, I kind of wanted to ask you a question brooks because obviously um there's always been room in the british psyche for uh, an underdog um we have like national holidays in england when you know, we win a bronze medal at an Olympic Games <laughs> or like before the days of, of, of Andy Murray when like a, you know, British man got to like the fourth round of Wimbledon, like you got a national holiday for things like that. <laughs> America, like from the outside, it's never seemed quite the same. Like a kind of, if you win, uh, you know, if you win your silver medal, you better chuck it in the ocean on your way back home. That kind of mentality. Like yeah. it does the same. Do you, do, you, do you guys have the same... Um, attitude towards near misses or is it just uh it just seems a slightly more um you know it doesn't seem as much compromise in the culture around sport yeah i mean there definitely is more of a results oriented culture but i i think there is still room for for the underdog um it's it's more based on uh the backstory of it and and the team or person's beginnings and, and the adver adversity they overcame and and the whole process and the journey um than so much the, the near miss itself um but yeah i think i think you know disney has made a whole industry about making movies about uh underdog tales and <laughs> and all that kind of thing so um i think yeah it's still very much part of the culture and your chapter is about um about the ghana national team um and what happened to them in in 2002 uh, at the hand hand literally of luis suarez why did you choose that story it's it's fabulously well written it's um there are bits in it actually that I that I completely forgotten. I I the Sulimantari thing obviously got um, engulfed by what happened to France during that tournament. Yeah. But uh, there, there's so much brilliant detail in there. Why did you Why did you choose that period in the what Why that team and, and that period in their history? Um, for a few reasons. So first of all, um, that wasn't top of my mind when when the guys contacted me to uh, to do a piece for this. Um, they threw out some suggestions, and and that one happened to jump out at me as as kind of an exciting one to do. Um, first of all, it's been 10 years, which kind of blew my mind <laughs> that it's been that long. Um, 
And so I thought it'd be a good time to kind of revisit that whole, that incident and, and the larger story of, of that team. Um, but also, like, like you said, there, there were things that I had forgotten. And, and there are so many details about that team that I think have been forgotten because of how that, that story ended, um, because of Luis Suarez that I thought it would be good to, uh, to kind of resurface them and, and explore it a little bit deeper than, than maybe had been done before. Not to give any spoilers, but there's a bit in there where you, um, where you quote Asimo Gian when he's talking about, you know, he, he, he thinks he's watched the game back about 20 times since, in the, in the 10 years since it happened. And it got me thinking, I just, I don't think I've ever been more relieved about anything football-wise than seeing him put away that first penalty in the shootout. Because can you imagine if, yeah. can you imagine the alternative? I mean, it's one of the best penalties I've ever seen also, the second one. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a nerveless and amazing bit of sportsmanship in a way. But it's just, um, it's, I, I, it's a, when we were, just before we were about to record, like I, I said, I was going to um, unleash a bit of a theory. Um, and uh, this might be about, you know, young people too. Um, but I wonder whether like, because obviously the, the the emotion that inspires in you when you see something like that is compassion because you think about the person and you think about um, the, the pressures of a country weighing down on him. If that happened today in our kind of lolling emoji um, culture and our kind of like forced schadenfreude over everything, do you think the reaction is, uh, do you think the reaction in the, the kind of the sympathy for him is the same? I think so. I mean, I think it, it wasn't far enough ago that, that I think the reaction would be hugely different. Um, the, the other element of it is that Luis Suarez just so overshadows so much of, of what happened there that I think so much of the, he just takes up so much of the focus that it, I think it'd be tough to focus too much on uh, either being, uh, making fun of, of Jean or, or, uh, you know, focusing too much on, on what he did there because the, the memes make themselves for Luis Suarez, as they always have. <laughs> In a way, he's kind of, he's the perfect person for the story. He is, yeah. he? Because he's yeah. the sort of like, he's a, the ideal 21st mm -hmm. century villain for a lot of kind of, a lot of very real reasons, a lot of confected reasons, a lot of, you know, just, um, you know, uh, different perceptions of him. Um, and in that moment, he leaned into it so much. Uh, yeah. After the match, he, he talked about how it was the new hand of God and how he had the, the, save, the save of the tournament. So he, he, he knew what he was doing, and he just totally embraced that role, which is, I think, kind of rare. I think what's interesting, Brooks, as well, is like, I think you quote a couple of the players as well. And like one, you know, on the one hand, one of the players is like, I totally get it. I'd have done the same thing. It's a national sort of, of national importance to kind of get that advantage, whereas other players just cannot forgive him. Um, and it's, yeah, fascinating to see how people that were on the pitch at the time view it completely differently well, as well. And, and that's what makes it so interesting because he, he did something knowingly. Uh, he was punished for it in the moment, um, but it still ended up helping his team. So the, the, the discourse around it is kind of different than your usual controversy because it, it wasn't a missed call. It, it, didn't, go, it didn't go unpunished. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of tough, tougher to wrap your head around that whole incident and that ending for, for Ghana than, than it is most of those controversial moments that we talk about in football history. Yeah, I think that the key word there is, is fairness. And because it's so unfair that the cheat prospers, I think that's why it's such a brilliant chapter. It's because, God, and, and also, I, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here, but I think a lot of people took Ghana to their hearts that tournament. Definitely, and definitely. Because it, was it 2010 that England were dreadful and had the Lampard goal? Was that 2010? Yeah. Yeah, so we needed our second team because we were out and it was just, it would have been such a brilliant, brilliant story if the, the first African nation to reach the semis and to be cheated in that way just felt so perverse. And I think that's another angle that we maybe have forgotten a bit when me and Rob, certainly we weren't thinking that when we came up with the idea for the book, but it's really nice that that exists in this world where also we've got a real affection for the teams that nearly made it but didn't. I wonder whether um, one of the other themes here is is like is pain and uh, unhealed wounds, because I um, I think I look back on my kind of football watching life um, with my own team, my national team, and I think the um, I think what stays with me more vividly is 
not necessarily moments of disappo- disappointment because um, let's be honest, most of us live in that world kind of a pe- uh, perpetually. And so you, you develop a little bit of a skin to it. But the kind of the, the moments of cruelty when you've, you've kind of, um, you've had, you've existed in about sort of 10 or 15 minutes where you can kind of reach out and touch whatever it is that you're aspiring to and it gets snatched away. Um, and I think I've always found those slightly more, more, more powerful moments. So for instance, I can remember, I can remember how I felt when I realized that Paul Gascoigne had not made contact with Alan, that Alan Shearer cross in 1996. At the same time, I, I don't really have any memory of um, England beating Spain on penalties, or um, I vaguely remember, a, you know, sort of a, a generalized joy at the, you know, during the, the 4 1 over Holland. But it's a much sharper feeling. I mean, Rob, is that the same for you? Um, yes and no. I, th- I think. Certainly, it's hard to thought of things as an example with Macclesfield because obviously <laughs> the one massive defeat that we just suffered is kind of trumps them all, really. Um, but you're right. I, I mean, I can remember um, Paul Harsley hitting the bar in a playoff semi final against Lincoln, but I can't remember sort of every moment of winning 4 1 at Tranmere the year we won the league or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I can yeah really sort of vividly see some of those moments. Like we equalised at Chelsea one year in the FA Cup. And it was ridiculous. Um, and <laughs> we got battered 6-1. And it's kind of, it wasn't even glorious defeat. It was just defeat. But yeah, there is that, I think it's that kind of, and we sort of say, I think in our introduction to the book, is that football's a real knife edge at times. And it's that kind of, you get so excited when the improbable looks like it's possible. And then it's almost like more crushing when when that, like hope is sort of just snatched away again moments later. So to the Mac example, like we scored and Lampard scored literally a minute later and yeah. everyone was still sort of celebrating the goal that we scored at the time and didn't even really notice. Um, and that, yeah, it's, um, I think it is that it, it's the kind of, it, yeah, glory and defeat is so difficult to sort of define, but I think we can all, we can all definitely pick moments where it's happened to us. I wonder whether it is going out of the game though as well, because I um, uh, Neil Atkinson wrote a fabulous chapter of your book. It's um, it's a really different piece of writing as well. Um, really original. Its narrative is uh, yeah, very very creative. Um, and he kind of I remember reading it and thinking, well, you know, he's he's going to you know he's going to build up to um, to the Gerard moment. Um, and you think about what that is, and you think about who Stephen Gerrard well, still is in many ways to Liverpool supporters. And I'm thinking kind of pre-2020 before they've, 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 they've won a title. And you think about what happened to him and you think about the randomness of it and the humiliation of it and just how public it was. And it's 20 years ago, you'd say, I think it would take a very hard heart to laugh at someone in that situation. Um, and I think a lot of us, Manchester United fans accepted might have kind of been slinking into our into our sofas as that happened and you know cringing out our spleens and yet he's become this kind of figure of fun and it's just like I mean I'll I'll go to you on it Adam I I just I wonder whether that's indicative of a like a a bigger change and a kind of a the the sort of the the glorious failure and the you know the um the going out on on your shield kind of aspect of the game I wonder whether that just sort of where that's gone I know this has become quite a fatalistic podcast, but it's that's that is how it feels. This is about more than just football and football. We, books, will, end, we will end on a nice note, don't worry. But uh, at the moment, no, it's um, I get what you're saying, and I don't want to be that guy that says social media, but I genuinely think it, it's changed everything. Now, it's obviously not just football. We've seen it with the US election. I don't want to go there, but yes, please don't. <laughs> no, I'm not, not going to go there. Trust me. But For it, Brooks's sake, don't go there. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> but it's been if a long you week. Think, if you think about the the time when Arsenal won it at Anfield, and obviously fever pitch sprang from that moment, I think that that moment now would be ha ha look at Liverpool throwing it away in the 90 something minute bottled it basically yes bottled it, it, bottled it, it, bottled the, it bottled the narrative it. would have been Liverpool bottled it the narrative isn't that now it's isn't this incredible that Arsenal did this and I think that's obviously how it should be I don't think it'd be like that now I, I think there'd be memes about was it John Barnes gave the ball away I can't remember the, 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 there would absolutely be memes about it and it would be you know Barnesy bottles it 
and there's something quite distasteful for that. And I'm, I think that I'm speaking, well, I know that I'm speaking for Rob as well. I think that we would rather have that romantic element where you live in the almost half space between winning and losing. And the half space is really fantastic because the half space means that anything's possible. And I think that's what the book is about. And I, and, and when I said I wanted to end on a good note, the, I think that's, that's how I would describe, well, there's certain chapters that maybe don't, follow that path but I think that the joy that something brings and living in that moment where it's almost possible is really beautiful and I think the book celebrates that and, and that's what we wanted to do. Brooks to go back to um, Asimov Jian um, because I think one of the things here is yes like um, we focus on John Barnes giving the ball away in that situation and mm. like I dare say like in the modern world um, we're not looking at um, the it's up for grab uh, it's up for grabs now moment we are you know, uh, you know, looking at the scale of abuse that John Barnes is receiving on social media as a result of giving the ball away in that situation, or you know, with the the Jian example, like, is there compassion there as a result of it? Or ten years later, even just ten years later, is it kind of like, are we are we shouting at football players again because they're showing themselves to be flawed? Because one of these things, like, I as the bigger teams get more powerful and the kind of the expectation for what they're supposed to achieve gets greater and greater. It's almost like now um, you're not allowed to make a mistake as a, as a top tier athlete. Um, like if you're yeah. a Barcelona player and you make a mistake, which leads to dropping two points in a draw away from home, you probably get vilified to a certain extent. I wonder what, I wonder what the reaction is to Jian today in that situation, whether he becomes just a sort of a villain of the piece, even, even with a Suarez type character involved in the, in the plot lines as well. It's, it's a kind of, it's a depressing thought, but it just seems to be that very quickly our, our reaction to, to athletes has, has become, I, I don't even know what the word is for it. I don't have the vocabulary to describe it, but vicious in a way. Yeah, and, and actually, Gian really did face that throughout his international career, um, even early, early on when he was in his early 20s and the up and coming star of, that, of the team, um, he, he was vilified for missing chances in, in tournaments and, and him and his brother tried to quit the team. And this happened both before and after this, this incident in, in South Africa. But um, it, it really has kind of followed him. And it, it got so bad that you know, he missed another big penalty a couple of years later in the African Cup of Nations. Um, and after that, after he missed two big ones in a row, he developed the reputation as the guy who misses important penalties. The bottom. And it, it got so bad that, as I said in, in the piece, um, he announced that he wouldn't take any more penalties for the national team because his, his mother, before she passed away, asked him not to. She made him promise not to. Um, so that just indicates the, the, the level that this reached. It's, That's it's kind of incredible. And, That's and it, it kind of followed, it's followed him, you know, over this past decade. Um, you know, he's, he's always asked about it even to this day. And, and it's just something that it's gotten to the point where he says he hopes that one day his kids can avenge his, his mistakes. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible thing to think about that he's still living with this 10 years later and, and it's that much of a weight on him, but but yeah, it's 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 really all cool. Yeah, that's that, that. His own mother doesn't want him taking penalties anymore. That describes something really awful, actually. I yeah, think that's a that's a that's a horrible thing to know. I'll tell you what we'll do. We we're a day into into lockdown, um, and uh, be pro kind of fun to go through our most wounding football experiences, um, just to kind of to 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 keep with the local mood. I think. Um, Rob, what's the thing that sort of What's the moment in your football sporting life which which scars you the most? Um, this, is, this is one of the segments I should have asked everyone to prepare for. It's like, so it's Scotland funny, so mate, Scotland, yeah, Michael Scott Town and Scotland over a lifetime. Um, <laughs> it might it might still come next week, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, come back to it, yeah. Um, I don't. I mean, uh, to be fair. And I can only really say this given the events, obviously that that mean. Macclesfield Town doesn't exist anymore, other than in a sort of re reborn Phoenix Club kind of way. Um, but I, I do think it's 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 part and parcel of of the game, obviously, and a lot of the kind of not certainly not the most enjoyable, but but the most memorable moments, like I was saying before, are kind of in those really, really those times where you where you unexpectedly achieve something and. Uh, 
I think with with Macclesfield, certainly that's happened quite a lot. I mean, definitely most most wounding is is actually off the pitch stuff. Yeah, um, and that's another kind of quite you know sad state of affairs for for football to find itself in at all levels where it's such a preoccupation all the time um, for clubs outside outside the elite or the top six or whatever you want or the Premier League, I suppose, really. Um, but but just everything kind of has has a knock on effect into those areas now it's very difficult to enjoy sort of even what's traditionally called grassroots football now that people are investing in that too kind of colored by <laughs> by league two and non-league kind of experiences it they, they should uh, and, and the, the happiest times that i've had are with football clubs that are still clubs yeah. um i think not football clubs that are plcs obviously have a very different raison d'etre these days and um, I much you know, find much more kind of enjoyment and and don't tend to get as wounded by by those instances where you feel a sense of what football clubs used to be like, which is that kind of uh, communal experience as opposed to results being the be all and end all. That's interesting. So do you, do you feel yourself getting slightly desensitised as time goes on? I, th- I think I think I probably will now. I think obviously I will get behind Macclesfield as a Phoenix club and and I hope that they do well. But it's just such a weird, such a weird experience to just have them just disappear out of existence to all intents and purposes. Um, and having been a very unpleasant kind of two or three years, punctuated by a couple of very unlikely survivals in League Two. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to see where that comes from and. But yeah, like I say, <laughs> Scotland next week might be the, the final nail in the coffin, to be honest. We'll see what happens. Well, I know we're, this is going to drift off topic just a little bit, but what's the Phoenix Club experience like in terms of not, you know, doing an FC United of Manchester and, you know, by choice opposing something, but really having no other option? What's the kind of the emotional attachment like in that situation? It's still very early days, I think, to be honest. Um, we're obviously quite lucky that the that the assets of the club has been bought by somebody who wants to make a football club out of it um, and who seems to have generally the best interests of, of the football supporting and football playing community in, in the town at heart, really. Um, but it's very early to say, I think, when that does happen, you're, you're still kind of sceptical because that's what all new owners say. Um, you don't, and obviously, no one buys a football club intending to run it into the ground. Um, so it's it's odd. It's, it's odd for me because I, I live in Glasgow now, rather than Macclesfield as well. So I think a lot of people have felt very close to the club as it's being sort of reborn a bit. Whereas the exiles, and there are, there are a lot of us around the country, but the exiles are a bit more kind of waiting for their <laughs> their appropriate moment and their appropriate way to get involved. But um, it's all. It's been positive. It's the, the main thing is having a club. Um, the main thing is having something to to get behind. Um, but yeah, it's definitely they've made it very clear, and I think it's necessary that it's a different entity. Um, and so it does. It is. It does feel quite strange to. There's no way that you just automatically start supporting that entity. <laughs> um, that'll that'll come over time, I think. Okay, so no wounding moment that we can dig into. That was quite disappointing, actually. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to not dignify that. That was a response. very, very long-winded uh, way of not answering the question. <laughs> sorry, man. Yeah, I'm in the wrong game, obviously. <laughs> uh, Adam, is there anything that jumps out of you from your past? I'm going to say that there's two. Um, the first one is actually the cover image of Gaza stretching for that ball against the Germans, which is brilliantly designed by Steve Laird, by the way. A big, you know... Big thank you to to him for for doing it justice. It, it was the fact that when I watch that back, and I actually watch it back more often than I should, um, I can't understand how he's not got the ball. It, it doesn't make sense. It it looks like it's gone through him. It, it's really odd. It's really 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 odd. And because of everything surrounding that tournament, that's why that one sticks out. So it was Britpop. I was a big Britpop fan. I still am now. Um, the fact that the Tories were getting kicked out. I don't, again, I don't want to get political. It, there was all this. It was just a brilliant, brilliant time. And then you had Cool Britannia. It really did feel like England was the centre of the universe back then. I know, I know that I was the, the ripe age of 12, 13. So it was the perfect age to be affected by that. But it really did feel... If if that's my... Say, just say that it was... I think it was Euro 92 that I really started to become aware of the England national team. And we were crap that tournament, and it's when uh, I don't. I think we got 
knocked out without winning a game. I think I think that's right. And then ninety four, we obviously weren't there, so it was being fascinated by Hadji and the, the Maradona story and all that. And then it was ninety six, and it was our turn. And you would be forgiven for thinking that we should have been expecting England to win every tournament after that because we were so good. I mean, well, I say that. There's a big caveat. Looking back at the games, we weren't that good. We, were, we shouldn't yeah. have been in the Spanish. Yeah. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have been in the in the semi-final, basically. But when we beat the Dutch, that stands out for me hugely. We looked phenomenal. When when the, the famous Shearer goal, um, after such a brilliant move, the Gascoigne goal, so there's some real great moments, but losing to the Germans on penalties and having Moller walking around. <laughs> Preening, it, it just felt, and again, this sort of feeds into what Brooks was saying, but it's nowhere near as um, catastrophic personally to someone like Asamoah Jan. But to see Muller lapping it up, and for the Germans to start singing, uh, "It's coming home," it, it it just felt really cruel. And I think it was a good grounding for a football fan to know that you're not guaranteed success. I think there's definitely, definitely that one stands out for me. Yeah, it's interesting is like you brought it up like uh, it was a very optimistic time um and that goes beyond sort of political allegiances or anything else it was that was a summer when the sun was out um the music was better than it had been for a really long time um and i remember we're roughly the same age um and so kind of in my childish sort of way i i couldn't imagine a situation where england didn't win that competition because it was it was so so scripted, it was so perfect. Things like Holland and the the penalty save and gas uh, against Scotland and the Gascoigne goal. And the thing about the Gascoigne um, moment against Germany is always it always makes me think of what a good commentator Barry Davis is yeah. or was. Yeah. Because it's the perfect moment. It's described in the most perfect way because it's kind of like a it's it so fits his his story the way he responds to missing the chance, what you've just described, which is kind of like, how do you actually, how do you actually not make contact with that in that position? Um, it was just, it was so, um, honestly, I, I, I'm not afraid to admit this. I still can't really watch it now. And it's been what? It's been 24 years. And I, so I, um, my wife is from Germany and um, she's 29 and so she has no real memory of Euro 96. And I, right at the beginning of our relationship, because she's a football fan too, I showed her the um, the the penalty shootout between England and Germany that night. And I, I, remember, I remember thinking, I haven't actually watched this since. I haven't watched all, all well, all uh, 12, unfortunately, <laughs> um, penalties back since. And it, you still feel something. It's really, it's yeah. a really weird thing to admit. Yeah. I'm exactly the same as you. And like you said, I think, you know, with similar ages, it was, there's something so powerful about that tournament. And like you said, it seems so scripted and it would have been so scripted if Gascoigne scores that goal to put us in the final. It, it, because obviously, again, for a view, well, if I say a view, for a listener of a certain age, they won't know the backstory. So the, the guys got absolutely trolled on a flight and it looked like, you know, players were going to get kicked out of the squad for this. There was a big media witch hunt um, led by the Sun, inevitably. And the, the celebration when Gascoigne scores that perfect goal against Scotland is so brilliant. It's so tongue-in-cheek and it so encapsulates the time. I actually think if anything encapsulates the time, it's probably that celebration. It's just, it's very, you know, there was like a Laddick coach. There was all this, it was such a, it was just a glorious time. Now, again, I, I think that I'm going to stray into wasn't you know weren't things better when when we were younger, but it, it just seemed like it was our tournament to lose, and we lost it. And and there again, you know, again that feeds into the book. It feeds into the book perfectly because it's it's moments that you you've won it. You've won it in that split second until you haven't. And I, and I just think that sums up so many of the chapters. That is so brilliantly written by by our writers. That's what I think. Yeah, it, it is just a, a wonderfully emotive book. Um, and oh, actually, I'm not going to let Brooks off here. We're going to explore. See what 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 skeletons lurking in your sports oh, closet, Brooks? Any any supporter of the U.S. men's national team will have a, a laundry list of them for you. Um, you have the the 2002 uh, quarterfinal against Germany with Torsten Frings handball on the on, on yes. the goal line. That yes, yes, was uh, magically not seen 
Um, you have Chris Wondolowski's missed against Belgium in 2014, which could have sent them through amidst Tim Howard's amazing performance. Um, and then in 2017, you have their still incredible uh, <laughs> miss of qualification on the final day of qualifiers uh, in Trinidad and Tobago uh, under just extraordinary circumstances. And they missed the World Cup last time. So we've had to live with that one for a few years now. But uh, yeah, lots of misery in, <laughs> in the US uh, history books. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? When you, when you reflect like this, you realize that actually so much of your football watching life in stadiums, around, you know, in pubs, at home, has just been conceived, has been defined by just terrible, terrible moments that you will ne- <laughs> you'll never be able to free yourself from almost. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. Guys, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Just, just before we go, um, where, can, where can people get hold of the book? If you follow us on Twitter, which is at Magic Spongers, uh, that was our, well, it is our blog. You can see plenty of tweets over the last few days. Um, but if you want to go direct, it is halcyonpublishing.co.uk. So that's halcyonpublishing.co.uk. Me and Rob have set up a, a publishing house basically to get this book out. That's the lens that we've gone to, so you've got to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to end the podcast with some emotional blackmail. It's just such a, such a winning formula. <laughs> If you're um if you're listening on YouTube, we will uh, we will put a link in the description. Um, and if you're on uh, if you're listening via Spotify, we will um go to the Tifa Football uh, Twitter feed and we will uh, make sure you're linked up there. Guys, thank you very very much for joining us, and, and very best of luck with the, with the book. Thanks for having us. Thank you.